you know what? I like this little bike. I think I might even buy one. Before we start, can I just say this is very much a first impressions video of the new Scram 411. It's more of a good poke around than a road test because, as you can see, the dealer was literally unpacking the two bikes he'd received while I was there. They very kindly invited me to come and have a brief test ride, but the bikes weren't even registered, so I had to stick to this private car park and couldn't even take the bike out on the public road. As there's a lot of interest in the bike though, I thought it was worth putting up this video, but it is what it is. Please don't moan in the comments that I should have taken it up a mountain, out on the motorway, or crossed a few rivers with it. I just couldn't. I have to say though that first impressions were pretty positive. It feels significantly larger, more substantial than the Interceptor I tried a few months ago and didn't like much. The finish is good, though perhaps surprisingly given that this is the more expensive bike, does seem a little down on that of the Meteor and recently launched Classic. Six months ago I got slated in my review of the Interceptor for daring to suggest that it wasn't perhaps worth the asking price, but this Scram is a full 2,000 euros cheaper and as such is a lot more appealing. I like unashamedly basic bikes. I was quite happy riding around on my ultra basic 9 horsepower Honda Vision for four years for example. So the idea of a decently sized scrambler with a 400cc engine, good dealer network and proven reliability all for just over 5,000 euros is very appealing. Like my Triumph Speed Twin which if I'm honest is a bit of a garage queen I could see myself using this bike in rough and ready situations and having a lot of fun in the process. Calling it agricultural would be unfair, yeah, really unfair. Um, rugged, I think, would be more appropriate. And it just feels right given the bike's vocation and the price and the fit and finish is good enough. The engine felt remarkably perky for only 25 horsepower, thanks to the way the engine's been designed, I suppose. An undersquare 78 mm bore and 86 mm stroke means that the 32 newton meters of torque arrives at just 4,250 RPM. So it feels meaty enough, at least within the confines of this car park. I'm sure it will be more than sufficient for the sort of off-roading I dabble in, basically turning off onto a dusty track through a forest, riding half a mile, and then getting scared I might get a puncture or be attacked by a lion without so much as a 4G phone signal to get me back to civilization. The exhaust note is pretty decent too, not too loud, but nice and bassy. The rear brake had a nice feel, but the single front disc with its two piston caliper on a 300mm disc seemed a bit wooden, although of course this was a brand new bike with only one kilometre on the clock, so no doubt this will improve over time, and as always the EBC sintered pad solution. It felt pretty nimble, certainly more so than the Himalayan on which it's based, much of this will be the front wheel dimensions, I suppose, which have been toned down to a 19 inch from the Himalayan to 21 and the slightly more cantered riding position. That suits my riding style too, so it's all looking pretty good so far. The Scram is also relatively light, 185 kilos dry, it's pretty good, and you can certainly feel the benefit of the weight reduction manoeuvring around at this sort of speed, which again is the type of riding I would be doing. I like the idea of the little tripper sat-nav thing to the right of the clock, although I have heard from several sources that it doesn't always work as well as expected. I applaud Enfield's initiative in giving their bikes this simple free sat-nav, but if I'm honest, I would probably just end up using Google Maps on my phone clamped to the bars. I suppose the tripper would be useful if you're going off-road to avoid your phone being shaken to pieces. But then again, many of the paths and routes you're likely to encounter off-road probably won't appear on the app anyway. The clock is easy to read, speed in both kilometres and miles an hour, unusually, on the analog speedometer, and then the usual warning lights, trip meter, clock, gear indicator, of which there are only five by the way, and fuel gauge. The information on the central LCD screen is legible even in bright sunshine but but as so often these days especially with retro style bikes the text is displayed in tiny characters so older riders like me might want to take their reading glasses 
I did notice a couple of welds that looked a bit industrial in a fourth road bridge type of way. The finish could be better, but it's cheaper like this, I suppose, and I'm sure they'll last forever, which is what buyers will want. The riding position is nice and upright, albeit less so than on the Himalayan, and this will probably be better for longer road-focused rides. The bars have been lowered slightly compared to the Himalayan, but still fall nicely to hand. The seat is at a good height for me, at 795mm, and it's quite narrow, meaning that flat footing both feet isn't a problem. The suspension felt nice and compliant too, although as you can see I was just riding around what is basically a flat, gravelly car park. There wasn't any excessive dive under braking, even if I wasn't getting to high enough speeds to test out the brakes to the full. I obviously can't comment on the fuel consumption, but Royal Enfield claimed 3.2 litres per 100 kilometres, and that would seem realistic for a small capacity Euro 5 engine. My Honda ADV 350 does 3.6 litres per 100 kilometres, but that has the variator to deal with, of course. This is a 5-speed manual, and so should be more fuel efficient. On the subject of the gear change, I have to confess I never actually made it to fifth in this relatively confined, confined area, but the gear change was smooth enough, even if, as I mentioned, the clutch lever is on the heavy side. Pickup in third and fourth was decent too, thanks again, as mentioned, to the low-down torque. Make no mistake, this isn't a fast bike, but I think you all get that. Roughly speaking, it's got a quarter of the horsepower and a quarter of the torque of my Speed Twin 1200, but at what I refer to as normal speeds, it really doesn't feel as sluggish as the figures might suggest. And of course, it's just over a third of the price of the Triumph, so I'm fine with that. Now the problem I had with the Scram's admittedly very popular Interceptor 650 Big Brother when I tested it last year and came in for all that flack was that at around 7,000 euros, it's in direct competition with what I would personally consider better bikes. I'm thinking here about the uh, Triumph Street Twin or the Honda CB500F. This 411 Scram doesn't really have any competitors and it's 2,000 euros less than the Interceptor. I suppose you could pick up a used Ducati Scrambler or a new Benelli 500 Trail for slightly more or the Himalayan of course if you're really looking for unburstable globe-trotting capabilities but otherwise the Scram pretty much has this niche all to itself. I believe there's a similar Yezdi Scrambler available in India, but we don't get that in Europe, so I have next to no knowledge of the bike or the brand. The Scram offers, I have to say, a refreshingly short list of tech stuff. You get ABS and this little navigation device, and that's your lot. Great, we don't really need any more than that on a bike of this type anyway. As with the Meteor and the Classic, the Scram goes with Indian tyres from a company called Seat, Seat, I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, not sure I'd want to put them on my Triumph, but they're fine on a low-powered bike like this. In terms of colours, as always, Enfield are offering plenty of choice with seven different paint schemes, though I don't think all are available on every market. Before I saw it in person, I thought this grey and yellow would be the one that I would go for, but I did quite like the blue variant they, they had uh, in the uh, workshop and were in the process of unpacking. At this point in the video, I would normally do a rocket score, but I really don't feel it's fair this time. I can't fully judge a bike based on a 20 minute poke and ride around in a car park, so I leave the scoring until I can test the ride the bike properly. Or, who knows, until I have one in my garage. Yes, I really was that taken by it. So, watch this space, and as always, thanks for watching.